the next 10 minutes or so, it is time to buzz through the rest of the carbonate minerals that we care about for the class. Systematically, we're just kind of, this is a continuation, but 407 to 416 is where you should look in the textbook. And we're going to start off with probably the most geologically important of the remainder, which is dolomite. Its chemical formula is CAMGCO3, but to balance that off, we need to have two of those. And when you picture dolomite, there's two different ways you can picture it. as a standalone mineral, like here shown on the right, or in the geologic sequence. And we'll talk about through those right now. The mineralogy of dolomite is that it tends to create these white to pink, kind of peachy looking crystals. That is the general form that it's going to take when it's not in the rock record or when it's like a more beautiful museum quality specimen. And we'll write that down. We are picturing this white to pink, uh, kind of peachy kind of color. And it'll form plates like we see here. And sometimes those plates tend to uh, will curve into one another, forming this kind of saddle shape. So we're going to write down plates or saddle shape and let's put that in parentheses or one of those quotation marks because the saddle shape we're looking at is kind of I'm going to draw this real light kind of like this that's our saddle shape but it's made of little like kind of flakes that are pushing down towards and then maybe there's going to be a kind of something like this I don't know there's this kind of shape to these inner growths that are kind of flaky this is not the best drawing in the world, but you see this is, you could, you could put some stirrups on this and ride it like a horse. So that's why it's saddle shaped. Another aspect of its mineralogy, and actually the most important way to identify dolomite is because it's chemical reaction and that it slowly fizzes in HCl. When you're out in the field and you're at this limestone outcrop, you can't really use color, you can't really use texture, although there are hints within that. The best way to go if you're dropped into a sedimentary sequence with a lot of limestone that could have a lot of dolomite is to have your acid bottle. And you are looking for a, a slow fizz, so slow in fact that it's almost hard to see the bubbles. So we're going to put a little star here that um, best way to distinguish from calcite in rock record. Now a geologist will encounter dolomite very often because of the process of dolomization. So our geologic occurrence, we're going to put the word here dolomitization. And the dolomization process is where is very common in sedimentary sequences with limestone and it's a replacement of calcium with magnesium. So dolomization equals replacement of calcite or let's say some of the calcium in a sequence with a lot of some of the calcium in a lot of calcite with magnesium and if we can get that partial replacement then we make a lot of dolomite and so there's a word I introduced last time which was the word diagenetic which is a process that occurs in a sedimentary sequence and changes it. It's almost like the word metamorphism, but the rock is still sedimentary. All right, so the word for dolomization, the big one is replacement of calcium with magnesium. It may do a lot of things. This process, we'll say, may uh, change color. And we get a lot more tan. We'd expect maybe more tan colors with dolomite just because of the hue that dolomite has of that pink or peachy. So maybe it's these yellower regions in this sequence that are dolomite. But you can't know that unless you've done some hydrochloric acid tests. The other thing that it may do is it may increase porosity. Now increasing porosity is the sign of dollar signs to a hydro carbon exploration person because more porosity can have more oil can have more natural gas and so they're looking for areas with dolomization and the reason why is because dolomite has a density of 2.81 whereas calcite has a density or sorry this would be a specific gravity the density would be in grams per centimeter cubed whereas calcite is 2.7 so if you increase the density but 
then you have to decrease the size. And as you decrease the crystalline size of dolomite, you might increase porosity. So that's the story of dolomite and dolomite. dolomite easy for me to say. Let's just move on to siderite. The chemical formula for siderite is FeCO3. It ends up being an important ore of iron, or at least it was in the historical past, much less so now. Our mineralogy for siderite will just be pretty brief and explain uh, the density. This is our most important factor for identification. Its specific gravity is 3.96, which makes it very heavy for a non-metallic mineral. And it's the one that could be confused with sphalerite. Of all the minerals that could be confused with sphalerite, in my opinion, siderite is the easiest to do that with. Color, it can range, well, it's usually a darkish brown, and the rhombohedrons that it's made from have a slight curve to it. It might not be too readily apparent in these pictures, but we do see the rhombohedrons and they may have a slight curve. So let's write that down as some of the aspects of mineralogy. So we're gonna say, we're gonna say it's heavy and it has dark color, tends to, right? The more iron and things tends to give darker colors. And we have curved rhombohedrons would be something that the textbook and I would like to point you to. Our geology to make siderite requires environments with a lot of iron and a lot of CO3, and these environments tend to be ones that have calcite. So let's say it's a carbonate um, geology with, and it has to have these additions. You're either going to be influxing that carbonate material with iron-rich fluids or getting deposition from iron-rich clays. And either one of these mechanisms can provide the iron that's needed in order to make siderite. Next mineral up, my favorite mineral. Da, 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 da. Um, this is rhodochrosite. Oh gosh, is it my favorite? Probably. No, benitoite might be my favorite, but that doesn't matter to you. All I want you to know is that I'm excited about this mineral, rhodochrosite. It is magnesium, nope, manganese, sorry, manganese carbonate. Anytime you get manganese in something, we tend to get pink coloration. And so this over here is a classic coloration of rhodochrosite. Now the most expensive collections of rhodochrosite in the world are from an area in Colorado primarily called Sweet Home Mine. The Sweet Home Mine has these beautiful stunningly red rhombohedrons of rhodochrosite. And then this example over here, this is a more common form where you get this kind of banded stalactite type form. And these, I think this exa example is from Argentina. Anyways, those are some of the places in the world where rhodochrosite comes from. We don't have much to say here. I just want you to know that it is pink and its value is just ornamental. People's bookshelves, maybe people's jewelry collections, but the hardness and cleavage that are super soft. It makes terrible gemstones, except for they're stunningly beautiful gemstones. So you'd never wear them, but you would um, collect them and maybe keep them in a safe. So in terms of our crystal form, you can get rhombohedrons and you could get banded crystal forms for rhodochrosite. The only mineral you can confuse it with is called rhodonite which is really the only other pink mineral, and this is an MN silicate. So in it, it ends up being harder with like a hardness of six, where this has like a hardness of three. All right, we're moving on. Mostly this is just a little bit of a show and tell, it feels like. H will be Smithsonite, named after the same guy of the Smithsonian. All right, that's why the name is similar. This is the zinc carbonate, and it's a beautiful mineral sometimes. Actually, most of the time, it's kind of a brownish, ugly color, maybe a bit of yellow. But from time to time, you get a little copper in that acts as a chromophore that gives it the value that it would have for museum displays. So our mineralogy of Smithsonite, and I'll, we're not going to do mineralogy or geology, we're just going to put a couple arrows underneath, is that you can recognize it because it is botryoidal. Not many minerals over the course of the semester about Chiodo, but smithsonite is. It is commonly brown. Commonly brown. 
but that's not the way you're going to see it in mineralogy classes or in museums because if it's brown or yellow it's not collected but the beautiful ones are collected and so even though it is commonly brown you, most of the time when you see it you'll see shades of green to blue so we're going to say greenish blue from chromophores chromophore is a impurity the chemical level that adds a color so from chromophores of copper and our geologic association with smithsonite is in areas that are rich in copper so let's put um, let's use this word super gene super gene means that it is forming above the primary ore in the area that's oxidized and materials being reprecipitated and chemical and having just different um, oxidation and leaching so it's a super gene mineral in hydrothermal deposits and then last oh it is an ore of zinc too the last mineral to talk about today is actually two we're going to group them together even though they are two different minerals they are some of the easiest ones for my students to memorize and understand they're very popular for collectors we'll put them together I is going to be azurite. Glitch, my pen's glitching out here as we're trying to finish. Okay, azurite and malachite. And now azurite can always be identified because it is blue, and malachite is always this beautiful, rich green color. So many times I tell you don't use color to identify the mineral. That is not the case here. Please go ahead and use color. Now, our chemical formula for azurite and malachite are almost the same. And all I actually want you to do as you memorize this one is that we're going to consider this a copper carbonate, but we're going to add a little water to it. So we're going to just call, this is how you're going to memorize it. You're going to memorize this hydrous copper carbonate. And other things to know about it is that they can form actual crystals. So here we actually do see some crystals of azurite forming, but most of the time azurite and malachite are botryoidal. They may also be massive. So this is the most common crystal form, and they also often occur together, like they do in this picture. The geology of azurite and malachite is similar to this up here the super gene of copper deposits and so what we're going to put is for the geology is that they occur in the oxidized portion oxidized portion of super gene of super gene zone oxidized portion of the super gene zone in copper ores Okay, so I guess another way to say ores would be uh, hydrothermal systems. The most important significance of azurite and malachite is that they're an ore indicator. So when you find these, they're a stunning color, they catch your eye, and it lets you know that deeper down, under the ground, there's going to be some valuable copper ore to extract. That's the end of carbonates. On to another family next time.